we've now got these new type of vaccines that everyone should be at least somewhat familiar with at this this point. I so know. the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are the, are the mRNA vaccines, meaning they literally contain inside of them small stretches of mRNA, which in this case encode uh, the spike protein of the virus. And the idea is you put these this mRNA into your body, your cells suck it up. They then make the spike protein and only the spike protein from the virus. So you don't get the full virus inside of you, but that spike right. protein can then be presented to your immune system, and that's what gives you this immunological reaction. Now, my question for you, Kevin, on on the genomic side of this is, if you take out the mRNA from one of the uh, mRNA vaccines that encodes a spike protein, and you put it side by side with the equivalent mRNA from the virus, are they exactly exactly the same, or are there differences oh, between yeah. them? They're very they're very different. So. Um, first, let me just qualify this by, I'm probably more vaccinated than anybody because of all of my lab work and dealing with these bugs you see behind me. Uh, so I've had to get, I've had to get, I, I'm a pin cushion for, for vaccines because of my days at Whitehead, we handled a lot of viruses and I had to get vaccine, vaccine for everything. So I'm not anti-vax when I come out and say this. Uh, there are very uh, material differences between the vaccine RNA and um, the actual virus the spike protein. And we shouldn't conflate all vaccines here. The, the, the two that um, have messenger RNAs that are delivering them with lipid nanoparticles are kind of unique in this regard. And that in order for them to do that delivery, both Moderna and Pfizer decided to swap out the uridines in the mRNA with the modified nucleoside known as N1-methyl uh, pseudouridine. That's a different base. That's a base that's a little sloppier. Um, it has much higher melting temperatures uh, than the uridine. So if you make an oligo with uridines all swapped out, even just four of them inside of a 25 mer it will change the TM markedly, like more so than swapping uh, from pyrimidines to, to purines. So it has a huge impact on the melting temperature. So, so is that, does that basically mean that this is affecting the stability of the mRNA molecule? This is the, this is the reason it was put in, is, is that the folks at Penn realized if you, the RNases can't cut this, right? So RNases oftentimes target the uracils and cleave the RNA and it clears the RNA out of the body so that you get really ephemeral expression of the RNA uh, and that can be important for a lot of cell biology in that they, the cell is anticipating these RNAs to get expressed at a certain level and to, to also decay at the same level because timing on, on making these things is important for, for, um, for cell circuitry. So when you, when you then introduce an RNA that doesn't decay at all, sits around for a long period of time and hyper-expresses inside of cells, it, it can throw off other, other types of, uh, of cell biology. But their goal is, this is early on, they didn't know, uh, their biggest concern was the RNA would get eaten going in and they just have no effect. So they mm. decorated, every, they changed every single uracil out with, with this pseudouridine, which means it doesn't decay as quickly. However, it also means that the translation fidelity is affected because now you have a different base in there and the codons were relying on uracils to teach them what amino acid they should be putting in in the ribosome. And they've shown when you swap that out with pseudouridine, the translation fidelity goes to hell. Uh, and so we don't really know that it's making the exact spike protein that the virus has uh, because... The, the coding system has changed. I mean, has anyone looked? That is the biggest problem, when I think, with these vaccines, is there's very little documentation of what peptides are being made in vitro. Um, the EMA has a document out asking Pfizer to clarify why they have smears on their Western blots of these things. So they, they do an in vitro transcription and translation reaction, which is a model for what uh, you're saying. So, so when you say smears on the Western blots, what that would, what that could mean is that instead of producing just the spike protein as it exists in the virus, it's actually producing uh, a range of sort of variant variations. Yeah, like a it. library, for perhaps truncated, right? I mean, one mm -hmm. one other aspect they did, um, which perhaps hindsight is giving us some um, knowledge on this, is that they they codon optimize these as well, which means uh, when, when you're coding for an mRNA. Um, there's multiple different codons of code for amino acids and uh, different organisms use these in different patterns, almost like dialects in a language, right? Uh, so humans tend to use a particular codon for arginine, which is CGG, CGG. And so CGG is the most common codon usage for arginine. The virus uses a different one um, to code for arginine. Uh, and so they, they change the, the uh, we have a, I have a preprint out on this where if you just take the GC content of these two, of, of the mRNAs that are in the vaccines and compare it to the virus, they ship radically because they code on optimize them. Well, when you code on optimize things, uh, the ribosomes move at different rates. Uh, and when the rib because they're, they're searching to find the anti-codon uh, tRNA, and if you happen to use a really rare one 
in a in a human cell, then it has to go find that 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 rare codon to, to put into the ribosome and read it. And so they move these away from the the codons that the viruses had evolved to use, which I think maybe that was a mistake, right? That the viruses chose the, that, those codon frequencies for a reason, and maybe that's part of its functionality is that if it used rare codons, so that when humans make it, it doesn't make too much of it. They then hypercharge this thing by using all humanized codons so that it should make even more spike protein. But more spike, spike protein may not be good, um, mm. right? Spike protein is what is believed to be the, the most toxic protein in the, in, in the virus and making a lot of it, while that might drive an a, a accelerated immune response, it might also drive a lot of pathology that's, that you don't see with the virus. So um, when they did this codon optimization, the GC content of the RNA has changed radically. When you do that, the, R, the RNA doesn't fold the way it's anticipated, and, and you form all of these quadruplex G units inside of the RNA, and that affects all types of other cell circuitry. But the ribosomes also don't pause the way they normally pause, and they've shown that if the ribosome the rate of translation changes, the folding of the protein on the back end of this doesn't happen in the same way. So while you might have the same amino acid sequence, given that you didn't have the fidelity issue with pseudouridine, assume, you, assume the pseudouridine didn't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. And you get the same amino acid sequence. It can still be it, different because the folding is different. Differently. Uh, and there's a great paper on this about ribosomal pausing. They actually can see this happening right in the furin cleavage site where they change the amino acid sequences to be very human, uh, humanized. That the, 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 the folding between the S1 and the S2 changes because there's ribosomal pausing that now happens uh, because of that codon change. So uh, it's very complicated biology that we often, uh, you know, the whiteboard of this where there's a codon table on mRNA and the stop codon and the start codon, and it makes doesn't exactly capture everything. Page really doesn't capture the complexity that goes on in the biology. So, but, you know, my, my biggest concern on them is we don't have good evidence of what these things make. I cannot find, I hope someone can correct me on this because I've been looking through the literature and there's so much COVID literature, I'm, pro I'm probably missing it. But the fact that the EMA couldn't find it either and Pfizer hasn't responded to these requests makes me think the data is not out there, uh, which is when you put these through an in vitro transcription and translation, or in this case, just in vitro translation reaction, you get a smear on a gel, not a band. You should get a single band. In fact, the DNA vaccines give you a single band. Um, the, the DNA vaccines mm. don't have pseudouridine in them. Um, so we can see the, the, like the adenovirus vaccines. Those things they've demonstrated, they make a single band. And sometimes these bands are not one band because they're the glycosylated and we understand that. But what we're seeing on the Pfizer one, at least in this EMA document, is there's a smear and they don't know what it is. Uh, which means we're injecting people with these things. Really, really what we're injecting was with a pro drug where the active drug has not been fully characterized. I see. So, so to summarize so far, RNA, we're talking about mRNA and the four letters that go with RNA that are used in RNA molecules are A, U, G, and C. So the mRNA that encodes the spike protein as it's found in the, um, in the virus itself uses A, U, G, and C. Now, the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna use A, G, and C, but a different version of the U letter. And That's the right. reason they had to do that was to stabilize the mRNA molecule so it didn't get chopped up so quickly that there was no immune reaction because they're trying to make a, a vaccine yes. that does that. The consequence of that that we haven't fully characterized yet because apparently no one has done the work to fully characterize it is that this can actually allow that mRNA that contains that that other kind of nucleotide to make a different form of the protein than what we think it's making, meaning it's going to make the protein we think it's making, but potentially also make other variations of it. And that's why you see things like these smears in these Western blots. Yeah. And there's some evidence beginning to build up in other papers. I think um, Bansel et al. Has, has a figure in their paper that, that tries to characterize some of these in cells, and they, they do see a couple more bands. Uh, it's a great paper. It shows that some of these spike proteins are circulating on, on exosomes in your bloodstream four months later um, hmm. in the vaccinated. Uh, Bruce Patterson's lab has done a lot of work looking at long COVID, um, and they're starting to see in the vaccinated, there's a mutated form of S1 that uh, their papers, uh, I'm, I'm dying to see their paper. It's about to come out in the next couple of weeks, but in a preprint form. Uh, but they've also noted that contrary to being infected with the virus, uh, there's certainly long COVID going on there. They're seeing some kind of long COVID-like symptoms in people that are vaccinated, and there's this different S1 protein floating around. Uh, we don't yet know if this is because of the mRNA or if this is like just glycosylation is different or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm waiting, I'm dying to see what the paper has to say about it. But um, there's another paper mentioned from Jiang in, in our preprint that looks at 
expressing some of these things and, and getting some some very smeary bans. And then there's the EMA document as well, where the regulators went in and were asking for why are there smears? Is it because the RNA also is fragmented? Because when they synthesize these RNAs, they're not always full length, right? Uh, so it, it could the smear could be a consequence of there being non full length messenger RNA floating around. So you get a truncated peptide. Um, it could also be a function of the fact that um, you'll notice if you look at these sequences, um, there's not just one stop codon. They put in two and three. Um, and I think it's because they knew that when you, when you replace the stop codons with pseudouridine, something that's quite common in the literature is that it can create frame shifts over the stop codons. So mm. the ribosome gets there, it doesn't, doesn't recognize actually stop. the stop codon because it's pseudouridine and just bumbles and frame shifts and starts making something else after it. So there could be some elongated peptides um, that... Uh, and in the back end of the Pfizer vaccine, there's actually some human peptide sequence in there. If it, if, if it could frame shift over those stop codons, which is a big if, it could maybe make some of that. And then you could get some autoimmunity going on. Uh, but the thing is, this is all hypothetical and still stuff. And we really need peptide sequencing on what these things make in humans. And some of that work is starting to get done by Bruce Patterson's lab, which, is, which should be really exciting to see.